Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be concluding this unit dealing with probability. I know, it's a bummer. But you know, all good things must come to an end at some point. Or maybe you're on the other side where maybe you've struggled with this unit with probability because I know first time through it can be kind of a challenge because there's a lot to keep track. But regardless, in this video, we're going to be looking at what we call, where we're going to be looking at two different laws where only one of them is going to be a valid law to be referring to. But we'll talk about that here in a minute. First, though, we're going to be looking at this definition of expected count. Basically, all that is saying is that if an outcome in an experiment has a probability of P, whatever that might be, then in n trials of that particular experiment, the expected count, the expected times that we'd exper expect a particular outcome would be n times P. So for example, I have four children. Let's say if you have a one in two chance of getting a boy or a girl, the expected count of having boys, for example, would be four times one half, which would be two. So you'd expect that if you were going to have four children, the expected count of having boys or girls, rather, either one, you'd expect to have two boys and two girls. Well, I end up having four girls. So that just illustrates the fact that the expected count does not always tell you what happens. It just gives you an expectation um, of what we can look for. Now. Let's look at another situation involving expected count. Here we have a town that has about 25,000 adults in its population. If the unemployment rate in this particular town is 5%, and we're going to sample uh, 200 adults from that town and look to see out of those 200 how many actually are unemployed, um, we can figure out what the expected count of unemployment would be by taking that 5% of unemployment times that 200. And when we do that, we get an expectation of 10. Now again, that's an expected count. And that 25,000 adults, that does not affect our answer at all. That's just um, an extraneous uh, information there. We're not going to be using that information. That has no effect um, on the outcome when we're looking at that sample of 200 adults. So that's how we would find the expected count. Now, let's read on to this next paragraph to learn more about expected count. So it says, if an event contains many outcomes, then the expected count of an event is the sum of the expected counts of the outcomes. To make more sense of that, let's look at this. It says, suppose that the wet season in a region is 125 days long, and there is an 85% probability of rain on each of those days, while the dry season is, those, uh, is the other 240 days of the year, and there's a 10% chance of rain on each of those days. So the expected uh, number of days of rain in a year not the accepted, the expected number of days in a year uh, that it would rain, the way that we figure that out is we would take, well, 85% of those 125 days, we would expect it to rain, and we would expect it to rain 10% of the day of the 240 days, and that would give me 130.25. Now, let's say that it actually, during one particular year, that it rained 144 days, um, in that region. Well, the difference between the two would be, well, 144, take away the, what we expected to have happen, the 130.25, gives us 13.75. And the percent difference would be to take that 13.75 out of 365 days total, gives us about 3.8%. So again, the expected count does not tell us what will happen in any particular case. It tells us what we'll expect to happen in the long run. Now this is a, an important, uh, interesting piece of history. During World War II, John Carrick, a South African mathematician, was captured by the German army in Denmark and interned at a camp. To pass the time, he did experiments on chance processes. In one such experiment, he tossed a coin 10,000 times, because I suppose he had the time to do that, and observed 5,067 heads. Well, we're going to figure out what's the expected number of heads in that situation. Well, we expect it to happen half the time, and half of 10,000 would be 5,000. So you would expect to get 5,000 heads if we were to flip the coin 10,000 times. Well, it actually happened 5,067 times, so the difference would be 67. Now, to figure out the relative frequency of heads, 
we would take what actually happened, the 5,067, and divide that by the number of trials, the 10,000, and we get 0.5, whoops, 0 0.067 or 50.67%. So what was the difference between the relative frequency and the probability of heads? Well, if I take 0 0.5067 and subtract 0.5, I get a difference of 0 0.00, oops, 0 0.0067. So that's the difference between those two. Or you could even say 0.67% would be the other way you could look at it. But notice that, so notice that difference between 5,000 and 5,067 seems like a lot. However, the relative frequency differed from the probability by only 0.0067 or 0.67%. So what's going on here is the relative frequency gets closer and closer to 0.5 as the number of trials increases. And that's what we call the law of large numbers that the more that we do an experiment, the closer that we're going to get to our actual probability, our expected probability. Now, you might have heard of law of averages, where someone's having a string of bad luck, and they say, you know what, well, due to law of averages, I should, you know, next time I play this game, I should win because I've had such a string of bad luck that I'm bound to win sometime. Well, that law of averages really is inaccurate because... Um, the probability, every time you do something, the probability is always going to be the same. Before the string of bad luck happened, the probability is still going to be the same. After the string of every single time you do it, you have the same probability. So there really is no such thing as the law of averages. So that is the law that is inaccurate. Um, so when you're asked about the law of averages, it is not true. Really, the law of large numbers is true, where the more that we do a probability, the closer that we would get, the closer that we would approach that expected um, outcome, expected probability. But that does not mean that on the next turn you have any more of a chance than you did on the previous turn. And that pretty much summarizes this lesson. It's pretty uh, simple there, just looking at those two different laws. Uh, so hopefully you understand the difference. Now there is an activity if you're um, using the UCSMP uh, function, statistics, and trigonometry book. There is an activity that you could do um, if you want to look in the book to just to illustrate the point of the law of al averages versus the um, law of large numbers. Uh, but for the sake of time and the fact that we're going to have different outcomes based on, because um, again, it's just a simulation that we would do, um, we're not going to take the time to do that in this video. But with that, we're going to end the video. So good luck now as you work on your assignment.